everyone. Welcome back to today's podcast. My name is Brittany Simon. Happy holidays or Merry Christmas, depending on what you're celebrating this year. As we go into the holiday season, I thought I would talk about attachment. It's something we've talked a lot about on the channel, and I'm excited to jump into it. Grab your notebooks because I have four examples to give you today, and you might need to take notes. With that said, before we jump in, I am drinking honey, water, and lemon. Just a tad of lemon. It is so good, and it is the vibe this week. Now, of course, this was inspired by requests that I had gotten over time to talk about attachment. So hopefully this helps you who have been pondering attachment and what is it. Now, other people have talked about attachment in the past. So I'm going to sort of do it through my own learned experience, giving you a tool that I utilize throughout my journey of letting go of attachment. And it's something that I do have to practice daily. I mean, I'm a person and I have feelings. And when you're practicing sort of letting go of attachment, you're practicing a relationship with peace. And so we're going to refer to Tao Te Ching today, and we're going to refer to four examples of attachment to sort of have a conversation about it. So first and foremost, what's the point of recontextualizing or being introspective in relation to your um, connection to attachment? Like what's the point? If you were Christian and you grew up Christian, you probably heard a reference to um, materialism, letting go of the attachments of the earth so you could have a relationship with God. Obviously, when I think about attachment, I think about an opportunity to seek out peace, which is sort of related to our joy, but also a more ascended version of joy. So not to get too metaphysical or spiritual or religious, but you sort of have to Imagine attachment as this burden, this physical burden you're going to carry. And sometimes it's really rational and reasonable to have attachment. And then sometimes it is also the thing that's holding you back. So you got to live a life with tiny contradictions. If you look at Tao Te Ching, uh, in my book, it's number 23. There's a passage that's titled Peace. It says peace is meant to be our natural state. So we're heading towards a natural state when we have a better relationship with attachment. Okay. A whirlwind, a, whir, a whirlwind never outlasts the morning, nor a violent rain the day. Just as earth and sky return to peace, so should we. Do you guys, like, can you imagine it? I don't know if you guys have imagination because some people don't see things in their head. But just imagine, like, the earth and the sky return to peace, so should we. It's about going back to a neutral state or a natural state. It's not about never loving people. It's not about eradicating your affection for people or things or emotions. It's about knowing the relationship you're supposed to have with those things and yourself, your consciousness, in order to maintain peace, right? Those who act with violence become violent. Those who act with virtue become virtuous. They who act in spirit of the Tao become Tao-like. They who follow the Tao, the Tao will guide. They who pursue virtue, virtue will reward. They who live by violence, violence will soon destroy. In other words, when you're having a relationship with something and you're attached to that idea, your consciousness will then reflect that decision to invest in that thing. That's why when we talk about karma, we're talking about karma is a reflection of what you've put into your life. So if you put into your life violence, you will be violent. You will get violence back, which is why even the other day on stream, I talked about how Self-defense is an act of violence that's necessary but does not need to be done because you're a violent person. If you are a violent person, you need to recontextualize that relationship you're having with violence. It's one thing to engage with violence in order to protect yourself. It's one thing to be a violent person, usually somebody who seeks it out. So just like Tao Te Ching says, right, if you live by violence, violence will find you, right? Violence will be your life, okay? that's That will be your karma reflected. And again, if you want to take this down in more just basic terms, bro, if you live by the knife, you're going to die by the knife, okay? If you live by obsession, you're going to die because of obsession. Having peace and having a centeredness because you are not attached is about having a proper relationship with things, a balanced relationship with things. So I wrote down four examples of attachment we can explore. The attachment of romantic love, the attachment of action, uh, the expectation of your action. So let's say you're a parent who has an expectation of a child. So that's the expectation of action, expectation of belief. So your community expects you to believe a certain thing. You think you should be believing a certain thing. Expectation of self, the pressure we put on ourselves. These are all attachments that we need to have relationships with. And we're usually born with attachments. Well, 
you could say you're born neutral, but like your environment, your bubble sort of encourages attachments, attachment to how you look, attachment to what you do, an attachment to how you study, what you pursue, an attachment to who you date, an attachment to money and status. You're attached to the shame of the bubble, right? And your bubble is anything from your culture to your belief system to any sort of um, concept around the why, right? Okay, the next part of Tao Te Ching I want to reference is number 63, small beginnings. Okay, so what we're doing as we're having a relationship with attachment is we're curating small beginnings, right? It says avoid uh, striving and practice non-doing. So when we're letting go of attachment, we're letting go of the perception of expectation. You are letting go of the expectation in relation to romantic love, expectation in relation to action, expectation in relation to belief, and expectation in relation to self. In, in relation to self. So you're it says avoid striving and practice non-doing. Now the conundrum is by practicing non-doing because you're doing it, you are also not letting go of attachment. It's almost like a meditative state, letting go of attachment, and it's past the ego, which is relating to peace, right? Okay, it goes on to say, learn to taste the tasteless, to grow the small things and to multiply the few. The reason metaphysics, the unexplained things outside of our physical world, that this idea is so daunting to people, especially someone as cynical as I am in relation to magic and God and all that stuff, is because it sounds unattainable. But I think the more and more you ground yourself, you practice a relationship with your consciousness, I actually think the human brain is so powerful our, our our bodies and our spirits are so powerful, and I don't mean in terms of magic. I mean in terms of like capabilities, like a computer. We're just so powerful that you have this ability to have all the tools within yourself. Now, of course, we go out and get tools. I'm giving you a tool right now. Hopefully, it helps you. But ultimately, you're the one who has to understand the tool and utilize it for it to be helpful. I can't make you better. I can't change your life. You have to change your life. So you need to learn to taste the tasteless, right? It goes on to say, respond to hatred with kindness, right? I usually pay attention to how I treat my enemies and I usually judge myself based off of that. I have a lot of attachment sometimes, you know, in regards to people that I feel like are unsafe or toxic. And so I work on having a relationship with the attachment to seek out a sort of justification, like a justice, right? That's my, that's what I need to work on, okay? It says, uh, resolve difficulties while they are easy, so don't let them build, and manage great things while they are small, right? Don't let things get away from you because you're distracted to the attachment of something else. All the world's problems will arise from slight causes, and all the great achievements have small beginnings, very true, so you're not going to fix yourself tomorrow. I'm not going to give you this tool and you're going to go, oh my gosh, that's it. I figured it out. Everything makes sense. Oh my gosh. Oh my God. No, it's going to start at a small beginning of an attempt by you to have a relationship with yourself. And then it's going to span months, days, time, hours, who knows, years. Okay. But it starts with a small beginning, like working out, right? The first day you go to the gym, you're not going to come out, you know, looking swole. It says, the wise stay out of great affairs and so establish their greatness. Many things they appear easy are full of difficulties. Again, I relate this heavily to going to the gym. Every time I see someone lift, I go, I can do that. Every time I see someone doing yoga, I'm like, I can do that. And then I realize I cannot because it's true that many things that appear easy are definitely not, including but not limited to letting go of attachment. Letting go of attachment is incredibly difficult right? I'm working on it. You're working on it. We're all going to work on it, right? And we're going to have different layers of relationship with it as we, as we head towards the end of our life, right? It says, this is why the wise consider everything difficult. So in the end, they have no difficulties. We're letting go of the attachment of the bigness and smallness and judgment we put on things. I should feel this way because X. This is what makes sense in regards to X. Like this is how... Okay, you're letting go of the attachment of self. You're letting go of the attachment of 
I, the other three in relation to other bubbles. So I'll explain. So let's say you have a romantic relationship and you're very one-sidedly attached to somebody and they've made it clear, like, I'm not in love with you. I don't want to spend my life with you in that way, but I love you as a person. You have to let go of this unrequited love by letting go of the attachment you have associated with that perception of love. You have to let go of that person's consciousness and let them really live their life so you can live your life. So you have to rework the perception you have of that consciousness because you're making it about you. When you have unrequited love, when you are one-sidedly in love with somebody or have affection for somebody or care for somebody, if you make it about yourself, right? And that's what you're doing. You're doing a disrespect to them and you because it's not even your true self. It's the version of you that is obsessed with that consciousness, right? Even as a sister, even as a sibling, it is my it is my job to let go of my attachment of wanting to protect my siblings as they go on their own journey. It is my job as an older sister to show them that they are free and capable and I love them and I trust them to go on their journeys even if they completely mess up everything. I will share my wisdom when they ask, and though it is limited because I'm not a wise person, I will share what I know, which is just my tools, and hopefully they'll utilize them, but they might not know how to, right? So I could even, they could even be watching this podcast right now, and they're like, oh, what is she talking about? Letting go of attachment. It's something that I've recently started practicing like four years ago, right? Letting go of attachment, having a reworking of that attachment. I know I probably worked in it in therapy as well, but I don't think I really processed it as working on unattachment or, you know, working on this like separation until I really started to meditate as much as I meditate now. I think I meditate a lot differently now than I used to. I think it's just gotten better because again, it started off in the small beginning and over time I've even gotten more tools. So it's not like you get the tool and you figure it out and you become a master. It's like, no, you spend your whole life becoming a master, right? You spend your whole life because there's always more to know. And every time you get to a new level, you realize like you're still at the beginning levels, but you're not at the beginning levels, right? Because there was always a version of you that started off. So when you have like a one-sided attachment, whether it's a parent to a child, a romantic relationship, you need to understand, is this for you, your consciousness, which is the only thing you're responsible for, or is it for the other person, or is it for the obsession your brain has with that person? So think about it like this, um, expectation of action. You know how a parent has an attachment to a child's action? The child has an expectation of the parent's action, and then the two of them, both disappointed in one another, hold on to the attachment of expectation of behavior for so long of their lives, they grow into 50-year-old traumatized, basically adults, right? The reason it is your choice to let go of attachment and therefore avoid trauma or your choice to have a different relationship with trauma is because it has to do with you, but you can't make your trauma about someone else. This is very difficult to do. This is something I learned in therapy as well as philosophy. When I did DBT and I learned that my parents' actions were well-intentioned, I let go of the attachment I had that they were ill-intentioned because it wasn't true. So I took that attachment I had to their ill-intention stereotype and I placed it as well-intentioned. And then I fully accepted that the road to hell was paved in good intentions and I was in that hell. And my parents unknowingly gave me a personality disorder, depression, anxiety, all the things I suffered with my whole life unintentionally. And then I realized, okay, how do I rework my attachment to this idea that my parents must be villains because I ended up sick? Well, I have to radically see them as a consciousness and accept them for who they are. This was not done overnight. I used to go home and test my patience with my parents, especially with the holidays coming up. I know a lot of you are going home for Christmas. This is a great opportunity to practice boundaries and practice unconditional love and practice radical acceptance and practice seeing their consciousness. So when you go home for Christmas and you view your parents, you have to Rework the attachment you have to this perception of your parents that you have and make sure that it's accurate with who they are as a person. In the same way you want to be seen and validated, can you do that to your parents? Can you see them and validate them? So you can rework the attachment you have to the expectation of behavior, especially if it's resentful. If you have a resentful expectation, a resentful um, feeling because they didn't reach that expectation, 
That's something within you. And this on the on the other 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 side, parents feel the same thing. They have this attachment to their children performing X way. And when their kids don't, it becomes like a reflection upon them. And then they grow resentful because they're not having a relationship with their consciousness and letting their kids go. They're having a relationship with their kids' consciousness that is not true. And then they're projecting and and distorting that relationship in relation to themselves. My kid doesn't succeed. I must be a bad parent, maybe. Or maybe your kid just made a different decision, right? Oh, I never succeeded. My parents must have been poor at raising me, maybe. Or maybe you made a decision. Or maybe they were not the greatest parents. Maybe they did fail. Maybe they were horrible. Maybe they were super abusive. Maybe you had a kid that just like came out wrong. Maybe you had just the worst, you know, cards dealt to you. But until you know the real truth of it, you're going to have the wrong relationship and then form the wrong attachment with reality. So you have to reform your expectations based off of what is the most true. I no longer have the expectation that my parents are going to all of a sudden become pro-LGBTQA. I have zero attachment to the idea that my parents might be pro-gay one day. And that has freed me of so much. I am so much more happy and free and joyful and light and oh my gosh because I let go of the attachment of a of a a, um I wasn't seeing my parents in order for me to have that attachment I would have to objectify my parents and force my version of what I want them to be onto them which is what my parents do to me and I don't want to do that anymore And like I said, you know, it didn't just happen overnight. I had to go home. I had to face my parents. I had to get triggered. I had to like, oh my God, this is what's happening. Let go of the attachment, Brittany. And then I would put down boundaries. It's not an ultimatum on them. It's a boundary on yourself. I would love to stay for dinner, mom and dad. But if you do start talking about LGBT people in a way that makes me feel less than, I'm going to have to remove myself so I can go home. And I hope that's okay. And then that's really just like a nice manners thing to say aloud. Yes, it's okay. You can go home. And then your parents are going to say, I can't believe you don't want to be around us. Are you saying we're not good to be around? And I would say you're wonderful to be around when you're not literally talking disparagingly against the LGBT community because I am queer and it hurts my feelings. And then they can go, oh, you're so sensitive. Fine. We'll stop talking about it, which is a win. That's good. Or they'll say, no, we're not going to stop talking about it. And this is our house. And you're going to hear us talk about it. You can say, "Ooh, you can absolutely keep ranting. I'm going to get into my car and go home. Because the boundaries on yourself, your parents don't have to stop talking about it. They don't have to. If they love you and are making an effort, they will stop talking about it. But if they love you and don't want to make the effort, they might still keep talking about it. And then you can say, you can keep talking about it. I'm going to remove myself. So this coincides perfectly with ideology as well, which is obviously the the root of attachment is ideology, a belief in what love is, a belief in what is good, a belief in what is bad. So let's say you have this one-sided romantic relationship. The reason it's hard or, or, or expectation of behavior of your child, it's because you have an ideology that allows you to justify maintaining this connection, this attachment, I should say. Because I, I say it, I say connection and you might think like, oh, I need to sever the relationship. Not necessarily, but you need to sever the attachment. And to sever the attachment is to let go, is to say, I am not in control of you. I'm only in control of me. And that is the only thing that I should be in control of. Because how cruel of me to try to control other people. Love is that is not pure, is one of the most controlling tools people use to justify objectifying a consciousness. So sort of unhealthy love, unhealthy attachment. So we want a healthy attachment that says, I love you, I have responsibility to you, I love our connection, you're my sister, you're my brother, I love you, you're my parents. And because of that attachment that I have to you, I'm also going to practice non-attachment, which is say that I respect, there is a boundary here that should be here. I love my friends, but there's a respectability, there's like a respect between us that there is going to be a boundary, right? I love you. I'm attached to you. I want to know you until the day you die. But also, I'm going to let go of the fact that I don't control your consciousness and I'm going to have you live your life. I'm going to have my own opinions about your actions, but I'm not attached 
to it in a way where it's not going to impact me and how I live my life because it is not my life. I'm not here to control you. Okay, the dilemma we have with romantic relationships and expectation of behavior is on the macro, it's easy to say that but on the micro, it's hard to practice. So in my own marriage as an example, obviously, I know that my husband is his own person and I am not attached to controlling him. I am only excited that we get to share a life together, but we are our own people sharing a life together and we've come together as close as we can to be one. But really, that's only because we're, you know, practically moving together. We share money and we share chores and we share life and we share expectations and we share taking care of Indiana Jones, our cat, and we share everything we're doing, right? But we are still our own people and I am not going to control him. He's not going to control me. We are radically always going to let each other go while still having an attachment of responsibility to one another. And what that allows for is for us to make sure that we are fulfilled throughout our lifetime while still being married in a team. And that is a very hard thing to practice because in modern relationships or in the world throughout history, I should say, there is sort of a possessiveness, a controlling element to a lot of what is love, whether it's between a romantic person or a parent and a child or a sibling or even a friend, there's like this toxic possessiveness because they're not practicing letting go. They're only practicing hoarding because they're afraid. They're afraid. I'm going to lose it. It's mine. You can't take it away from me. It's not about being taken away. It's about just being able to be free, to live without these burdens, right? So Tao Te Ching, number 69, know your weakness. A great military general once said, I dare not invite conflict as a host, but always act as a guest. I hesitate to advance an inch and I am quick to withdraw a foot. This is advancing by not advancing. It is winning without weapons. It is charging without rage. It is seizing without force. Do you get what I'm saying? It's about going with the wave of the ocean instead of fighting against it. It's about playing your cards correctly. It's about being thoughtful and and wise if possible. There is no mistake greater than making light of an enemy. Through overconfidence, we make ourselves vulnerable. I'm so overconfident. I know what's right for my child. I'm so overconfident. I love this person more than they could even love themselves. I'm so confident that I know what's best for them instead of allowing yourself to let it go. When well-matched, armies come to conflict. The one that is aware of its own weakness conquers. Having attachment is a form of weakness in a spiritual sense, not in a micro sense. Obviously, you have a responsibility to the attachment you have to your children. I'm attached to some YouTubers I have parasocial relationships with. I'm attached to my favorite candy brands. I'm attached to music. I'm attached to XYZ. You just name whatever it is. We're all attached to something, okay? But that attachment is different, okay, than the attachment I'm talking about when I'm saying let it go. I'm saying recognize your weaknesses. Recognize that your obsession is a weakness. Recognize that your version of toxic love is a weakness. Having an overbearing parent who forces their child in a direction is weakness. Having love for somebody romantically who cannot love you back because you're objectifying their consciousness is a form of weakness. It's not bad to be weak and ask for help. It is bad to give into your weakness that leads to ugliness, which leads to what the religious would call the sin, right? There is a weakness in Cain, which allowed him to attack Abel, right? There is a weakness in all of us, Abel, who could have cried for help because he was being attacked. There is a weakness that is healthy and there is a weakness that is unhealthy. One leads to ugliness of the consciousness and one leads to Um, vulnerability in the most beautiful way. Attachment is the same thing. We can attach in a healthy way, which is beautiful. I value you. I value your uniqueness. I value your journey. Or we can attach in a way that says like you're mine and I own you and you can't, uh, you can't run away from me. I, uh, you're mine. It's ugly. It twists your face. Your mouth gets, you know, it's, it's very ugly. You cry, you weep in a horrible way. You don't cry in a healthy way crying in a healthy way because you're joyful versus crying in a way because you've lost something that you felt you were owed. It's yours, right? Death is often a relationship you can have with this conversation where, again, you're attached to the process, 
but you let go of the burden of hoarding the consciousness. Um, my siblings, my brother, uh, I told you guys they were pregnant with their fifth. They just had a miscarriage. And that's just a part of life. They do not hold on to the attachment of who the baby was supposed to be. They hold on to the reality and that the baby didn't make it, right? Miscarriages are very common. They happen. We as a family practice radical acceptance around miscarriages. I know some families, in my opinion, hold on way too hard to the attachment of losing that child. In my opinion, I think they take on the burden of suffering in a way that is about themselves, you know? It's about you and you have to let go of that attachment so that baby can be released so you can be released. It's okay to mourn. In my family, we hold like a little funeral for the babies or we say like a little prayer because that baby was like a little consciousness that didn't make it to term. But we're not going to like have it ruin our life because that's just how human beings procreate. That's how the cycle goes. Some babies make it, some babies don't, right? My grandma lost a few living children. My grandma lost, like I lost an uncle and an uncle who are twins um, because there was an accident in Iraq and they died. You know, you're not going to like have your whole life torn up about it because at the end of the day, as sad as it is, it's also a part of letting go of the attachment that you are allowed to possess this child's life. Nature will take your life away from you nature will take away your children and take away your existing. And I know this is kind of more at an advanced level of attachment. So I don't want to like hurt anyone's feelings before Christmas here, but this is a more advanced level of letting go of that attachment. You're letting go so much. You're radically accepting your power in the universe, which is little. And you're saying, okay, I'm letting go of the fact that I do not control life and death. And it does not control me. That is a very beautiful step to eventually get to. You're going to let go of the unrequited love. You're going to let go of your child not being perfect. You're going to let go of your parent not being perfect. You're going to let go of your job and life and existence not being perfect. And then you're going to move on to the stage of letting go of life itself. You are attached to the life you have. So you have a responsibility to eat and food, water, shelter, take care of people. But spiritually, you're going to let go of the attachment of life itself because you were not because you are not going to go down the path of ugly possession. I'm going to cling to life no matter what. I'm going to cling to life so much. I'm going to push a child out of the way and have it killed instead of me. I'm going to hold on to life so much. I'm going to become ugly inside and out. And I'm going to steal from the poor to be rich and put, you know, don't become so ugly and so concerned with living that you do horrific things to other people to justify your life. Don't become so unattached to life that you give up on living. Have a nice balance between the two. I respect the fact that I'm here enough to show dignity to myself and I respect my life enough to let it go when it is time. Attachment is the thing that is holding you back and it is the thing that's defining you as a person. Having the balance between healthy and negative attachment is a skill. It's a skill. It's a tool. Read Tao Te Ching, read your philosophy books, Figure out what's going on with you and who you are and why you have these unhealthy attachments, whether it's mental health or whether it's a philosophy issue, right? You're always looking for balance. Number 13, avoid extremes. Flattery and disgrace are both to be feared, just as overeating and starvation are both harmful to the body. Flattery is fattening to the spirit. Disgrace is emaciating. Overconcern is just as harmful as disregard. Treat yourself well, but don't pamper yourself excessively. If rulers treat the people in the same way, neither too soft nor too hard, they are worthy to be trusted with authority. And the last one from Tao Te Ching that I'll read to you is number 47, Explore Within. Without going abroad, you can have knowledge of the world. Without gazing at the stars, you can perceive the heavenly Tao. The more you wander, the less you know. The wise explore without traveling, discern without seeing, finish without striving, and arrive at their destination without leaving home. You look to yourself and you ponder. You go to the outside and you look for tools and you come back and you ponder. The answer is within you because it is about you. It is about you without seeking narcissism. It is about you without seeking ego. It is about you without it being about self. But it is about the self. It's about the consciousness. Practicing meditation and letting go of attachment is a very difficult concept because it feels so contradictory. 
But knowing the difference is the nuance. Again, it's okay to be attached. It's okay to love people. It's also necessary to let them go. It's like I always say those little sayings around the world and the little Hallmark cards are always a little bit real. If you love it, let it go. It's about letting go of attachment, your need to control. It's about having a better relationship with your fear. Fear is the root of all evil. There's healthy fear, which is about survival. But then there's that fear of attachment, of letting go, the fear of what if, let it go. You were never in control in the first place. And pretending you're in control is like a lie you're telling yourself. And you're probably causing more harm, not only to yourself, but to the people around you. Okay? Please have an amazing holiday season with your family and friends. If you find yourself in a position where you are feeling suffocated by your family, remember to say, I love you. I'm open with boundaries. I'm going to go back home. I'm going to take a break. I'm going to go meditate. I know family holidays can be intense. So be kind to yourself. Be kind to others. And then if you have any questions about attachment or other tools that I, you know, you want from me, I'm happy to give them to you. Just leave a comment in the sections down below. I really feel like this helped me throughout my journey. I know without it, I don't think I would have been as joyful and happy and peaceful as I am now. And I'm still always working on it. I am never done learning. I'm never done being a student. I'm never done picking up tools. I will practice also having a balance with attachment for the rest of my life. Because I will also have to have a better relationship with my fear, my knowledge of letting go of the reality that my husband will die, I will die, my nieces and nephews will die. Life around it will cycle through and will go through cycles where everything I love and everything that I am and everything that I own will not be mine one day, which is why having an attachment to it is going to end up stifling your growth, especially as a consciousness, right? But that is something that even I will be dealing with for the rest of my life. It starts with small things, not worrying about a mug breaking in the kitchen or not freaking out that your kid, you know, drew all over your favorite pillow or not freaking out that, you know, something broke. It's let it go. It's life. Let it go for your sake and for the sake of people around you. Okay. Talk to you guys soon. Please leave your comments in the sections down below and have a great holiday season. Bye. My head in real life while I'm dead My belly's being fed and I'm okay I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine Not to you in my mind, cause I know I don't make sense I've been nothing but blessed So why's my life a mess? Please tell me, cause I'm sick of thinking Yeah, I'm sick of reaching out for the truth and living life as a fool